Hey, I'm Charles Hoffman from BlackGhostAudio.com, and I'm going to teach you what mastering is and how to master your music at home for streaming services step by step. We're not going to be making some useless pre-made mastering chain here. You're going to learn how to create your own custom mastering chains made specifically to meet the needs of your songs by listening for five different types of issues. On top of that, I'm going to show you which settings to use when exporting your masters. But first, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, which is DistroKid. DistroKid is the music distributor that I use to upload my music to streaming services like Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, TikTok, and YouTube. If you collaborate with other artists, DistroKid makes it really easy to split streaming royalties thanks to its Teams feature. You can add unlimited collaborators on any track, change royalty splits at any time, and go back in time to view previous royalty splits. For privacy, collaborators can only see the royalty percentage they get, and they can't see who your other collaborators are or what percentage of royalties that they get. Collaborators will need a DistroKid account to use this Teams feature, but they'll get a 50% discount when you invite them to DistroKid as a collaborator, so they'll be able to sign up for only $10. If a collaborator decides to take their time signing up, your release won't be delayed. Their share of the royalties will be held for them until they join, and if they never join, you can reallocate their royalties however you want. DistroKid doesn't take a cut of any of your royalties, so you and your collaborators keep 100% of the money you earn. It only costs $19.99 a year to sign up for DistroKid and start uploading an unlimited number of songs to streaming services. When you sign up using the link below, you'll save 7% on your first year's DistroKid membership. Mastering is the process of making a master copy of a song from which all other duplicates of the recording are created. For vinyl distribution, mastering refers to creating a vinyl lacquer master, which is used to press vinyl. And back when CDs were relevant, mastering meant making a glass CD master, which was used to mass produce CDs. With streaming services now dominating the music scene, the digital file that you upload to these services is referred to as the master file. Technically, and regardless of the quality, any file you bounce from your digital audio workstation and upload to streaming services is considered a master file. Commonly, when someone tells you their song has been mastered, they likely mean that stereo bus processing has been applied to the audio file. This is done in an attempt to enhance the audio file's playback quality for the destination format, which in our case is going to be streaming services. If you're mastering a song for vinyl or you're mixing the audio of a show for Netflix, there are precise formatting requirements that you have to adhere to. For example, if the grooves cut into a vinyl record are too large, they can cause the needle of a record player to jump or skip. If the dynamic range of the show you mix for Netflix doesn't adhere to certain standards, the show could get rejected by Netflix. Luckily, there aren't many rules you need to follow when mastering your music for streaming services. The formatting requirements for uploading a song to DistroKid are minimal, and it's highly unlikely that your music will get rejected for technical reasons. With there being very few technical limitations, you're left with a problem. What are you meant to do to your music when mastering it for Spotify, Apple Music, etc. This is where a lot of the mystery and confusion comes from in regards to mastering. In some rare situations, you don't have to do anything to your mix before uploading it. If you're completely satisfied with how it sounds and it's hitting an appropriate loudness level, which is something we'll be taking a look at, then you don't necessarily need to do anything to it. There are multiple different components that play into mastering, like room acoustics and hardware, but I want to dial things in and specifically focus on plugin processing. In my opinion, every master master bus processing decision that you make should be aimed at fixing some type of problem, whether it's a formatting issue or an issue that's subjective. If a mastering decision you make doesn't fix a problem, it's either creating a problem or failing to enhance the quality of your master, making the processing you've applied unnecessary. Keep this in mind as we move forward and you shouldn't have any issues deciding when it makes sense to apply certain forms of processing. To be able to identify a problem, you need to have an idea of what your master should sound like. There has to be some sort of goal or standard to strive for. Choose a reference track that you consider to be mixed and mastered well and that's of the same vibe and genre as your song. If you can make your song sound like the reference, you win. That's the end goal. If your mix isn't as punchy as the reference, that's a problem. Problem. If it's not as wide as the reference, that's a problem. If it's not as loud as the reference, that's also a problem. As we take a look at how to fix different types of issues, you're going to be using a reference track to gauge whether or not these problems exist within your mix. When you have something to compare your mix to, issues become very obvious. Moving forward, I'll be mentioning certain mastering plugins that I've included affiliate links to below. If you make a purchase after clicking one of these links, 
Black Coast Audio will make a small commission, so using these links is a great way to help support the channel. So what does it mean if someone says a mix sounds loose? That's a bit of a funny way to describe a song, but it means that your vocals, synths, drums, and other instrumental groups feel detached from one another. By compressing your entire mix using bus compression, you can help glue your song together to provide it with a sense of cohesiveness. Bus compression is often the first form of processing I apply to a mix if I'm trying to provide the mix with a more cohesive sense of space. Take a listen to the following audio example to hear what this sounds like. This is meant to be a subtle effect, so there isn't going to be a drastic difference. If you're having trouble hearing the difference, listen to how the drums have become a little punchier, and the quieter sections of the mix have slightly increased in loudness, but the peak level of the mix has remained pretty much the same. Bus compression is a good way to slightly increase loudness without sucking the life out of your mix. Yo, she just wanna be my main squeeze, yeah, yeah. Stuck in the trap, I can't leave. To pull off this mastering technique, you need to use the right type of compressor and appropriate bus compression settings. Many different types of compressors exist, but SSL style VCA compressors are popular for mastering purposes because they generally provide a very precise level of control and a sound that's predictable and clean. They're typically snappy and punchy, making them excellent at preserving the transient information in your mixes. The Waves SSL G Master Bus Compressor is a classic mastering tool that emulates the center compressor found on the SSL 4000 G series console. You'll see mastering engineers that use this compressor all the time. It sounds especially great on pop and EDM tracks, but it's very versatile. If you can only get your hands on one master bus compressor, this is my recommendation, and you can actually demo the plugin for free using the link below. To start, you should dial in your ratio. 2 to 1 is going to apply a gentle form of compression, and that's the setting I would default to unless I was processing a really aggressive EDM or hip hop track. In that case, I might kick it up to 4 to 1, but I'd probably still start by using a ratio of 2 to 1 to see how things sound. Remember, subtlety is key here, and we're not trying to make drastic changes with this compressor. You want to use a long attack time like 10 or 30 milliseconds so that you don't crush the peaks of your mix. Using a long attack time is going to gently round out peaks, but not suck the life out of them. Your release time should be quite fast. I recommend using a release time of 0.1 so that gain reduction stops getting applied to your mix when there are no peaks in the signal. If there's a peak in your mix that causes compression to occur and your compressor takes too long to stop applying compression, you can end up introducing a pumping effect which isn't something you want when mastering. By default, the makeup gain is set to 3 decibels on this compressor which is just going to make the output level louder. We don't want that so set it to 0 for the time being. Now play back the loudest part of your song whether that's the chorus or the drop and reduce the threshold level until you're seeing roughly 1 to 2 decibels of gain reduction being applied. Since the peaks are being brought down in level by one decibel on average, I'm going to apply one decibel of makeup gain so I can perform a level matched AB comparison. Let's take a listen to see how this sounds. A 
Okay, so that sounds pretty good. However, if you decide that your drums are cutting through the mix a little too much, you can actually reduce the attack time and that's gonna smooth out your drums a little bit more. I tend to find that anything under 10 milliseconds is too fast and the drums start to get buried in the mix and lose their power, so just be careful of that. That's pretty much all there is to it. You can save those settings as a preset because if your mix needs bus compression applied, those are generally the settings you want to use and you can tweak them as necessary. So if your mix sounds loose, apply bus compression. If you think your mix sounds fine but you still want to see how bus compression sounds, try it out. If you like how it sounds, use it. If you find that it starts to suck the life out of your mix and kills the transients too much, don't feel pressured to use bus compression. Being able to identify when not to use processing is just as important as knowing when to use processing. Use your ears, trust your judgment, and try to avoid tricking yourself into thinking that more plugins result in a better sound. That's not always the case. And it's definitely not the case if those plugins are working against you. Remember, your mix should already sound good, and what we're doing here is just improving it slightly. At a mastering level, you have an opportunity to provide your mix with some additional color using saturation. Saturation is essentially a mix of distortion and compression. It generates additional harmonic content but keeps it in check thanks to the compression it applies. Gentle saturation can seal your mix with a sound that acts like a glossy finish on a painting. If you're using a stock saturator, choose a light saturation algorithm and then gently drive your mix. To compensate for the increase in loudness, make sure to turn down the saturator's output. I'm not going to get into the other settings here because your stock saturator could look quite different, but the other controls on your saturator are likely just tone shaping options that you can play around with to rebalance your mix once saturation has been applied. For example, if I notice that my low end has become a little more distorted than I'd like, but the rest of the mix sounds good, I can reduce this bass control to reduce the amount of saturation applied to low end frequencies. Saturators like FabFilter Saturn 2 are capable of applying saturation in a way that is effective, but not necessarily overwhelming. The tape saturation algorithms emulate the saturation applied by tape machines, which tends to sound rich and warm, making these algorithms great for mastering. The other reason I really like using Saturn 2 is because it's a multiband saturator with customizable crossover frequencies, so I have a lot of control when it comes to processing certain frequency ranges differently. I might want to lightly saturate my low end to avoid making my bass sound rumbly, and then drive the mids and highs by different amounts. If I wanted, I could even apply different types of saturation to each band by changing the saturation algorithms being used. If you want to add a little character and a little gloss to seal your mix together, use whichever saturator you have available to you, but use it in moderation. Big changes can cause issues while little changes add up in a big way. With some bus compression and saturation applied, you're already going to notice a pretty significant difference in your mix. Bus
Plus compression and saturation aren't always going to help your mix. Sometimes you might notice a loss in clarity and decide that this form of processing isn't worth it. It happens. To know for sure whether this processing is helping or harming your mix, all you have to do is bypass the processing. But when you do this, you need to make sure that you've used your ears to match the loudness of the mix pre and post processing. If the processing you've applied has made the signal louder, you're naturally going to favor the louder signal. If it's made it quieter, you're naturally going to favor the unprocessed signal. So to take loudness bias out of the equation and conduct an accurate AB comparison, you need to match loudness using your ears pre and post processing. Even once you've done that, there's still a risk of tricking yourself into thinking the processed signal sounds better. We want to believe that the processing we've applied has helped in some way, so you might just convince yourself that it has. To avoid this, close your eyes and toggle the processing on and off a few times so that you don't know what state it's in. With your eyes still closed, you'll be able to make an unbiased AB comparison. In the state that your mix sounds the best, open your eyes. If the processing is turned off, you don't need it, and if it's turned on, keep it. The stereo image of your mix is controlled by the way you decide to pan track elements. Stereo recording an acoustic guitar with two microphones and then panning one recording to the left and the other to the right is going to create a wide stereo image. In contrast, if you don't pan any of the recordings in your mix to the left or right and keep everything centered, your stereo image will remain narrow and focused. I've included a link to a video I made about the difference between mono and stereo sound that elaborates on this concept of a stereo image. You need to watch that if you're unfamiliar with this concept. Concept, it's absolutely essential for mixing and mastering. When you mix a song, one of the main goals is to pan elements across the stereo field in a way that is tasteful, highlights different elements of the mix, and provides your mix with clarity. Sometimes, despite your best efforts while mixing, the stereo image of your mix can still benefit from a little cleanup at the mastering stage. Using a multiband stereo imager like the one included with Isotopes Ozone 9, you can narrow or spread certain frequency ranges, which lets you provide definition to the stereo image. A stereo imager isn't a common stock effect, so you'll probably need to use a third-party multiband stereo imager if your DAW doesn't include one. This is very much a mastering plugin. Narrowing the bottom of your mix can provide it with low-end clarity, while progressively spreading the stereo image as you move up the frequency spectrum can help fill out the stereo field and reveal hidden qualities in your top end, such as buried hi-hats. You should definitely have a goal in mind before you start playing around with these bands, so use your reference track to see how your mix stacks up against it. A stereo image meter, like the one found in ADPTR Audio's Metric AB plugin, can be used to compare the stereo image of your mix to the stereo image of your reference. You can toggle the stereo image meter into an overlay mode, and then adjust your mix using the Ozone 9 imager until it looks like the reference. Be careful when doing this though, because you may or may not like how these changes sound, and and the quality of the results depend upon your mix. If you didn't mix your song in the same way that the reference song was mixed, trying to match the stereo image by pushing the bands on a stereo imager might not sound great. You might want to use a different reference track instead. Lots of artists mix and master their tracks into the shape of a tree. The low end is narrow and the top end progressively spreads out. The idea is that this ensures minimal phase issues when the mix is summed to mono. You shouldn't hear a significant loss in energy when your mix plays back through a mono system but there's no rule stating that you have to do this. Deadmos released a song with lights called Drama Free that sounds like it was run through a stereo imager cranked up to 100% on every band. For copyright reasons, I can't play you that song, but I've included a link to it if you want to check it out. This was a big release by a massive artist, and it completely goes against what I'm suggesting here. I don't particularly like how the stereo image sounds in that song, but it was an artistic choice that Deadmau5 made. If you want to do the same thing, then that's up to you. When applying a stereo imager to your mix, try to match the stereo image of your reference song and then listen for a loss in low end energy and punchiness when you sum the song to mono. If you like how it sounds, you're good to go. If not, adding width using a stereo imager probably isn't the best move. So again, use your discretion. When 
you're mastering your own mixes, the assumption is that the mix starts out balanced the way you want. You're the person who mixed it. So the only time you should need to use an EQ is if you've applied some other form of processing to deal with another issue, which has unintentionally unbalanced your mix. For example, if applying bus compression made the top end percussion in your mix more present, you might want to apply a high shelf filter to accommodate for that by gently rolling off the top end. Maybe you've applied some saturation and the low end has become a little too overwhelming. No worries, just roll off the low end slightly. If the vocals have become somewhat hidden, boost the mid range around 1500 to 2500 hertz. Since most of your mastering tools are gonna provide subtle forms of processing, you don't usually need to make big EQ adjustments to fix imbalances caused by the processing you've applied. We're talking 0.5, one, maybe two decibels here, nothing extreme. On top of that, you're generally gonna find yourself using wide bandwidths to affect broad frequency ranges. This is gonna sound the most natural. You you can use your stock EQ, especially if you're just using it to gently rebalance your mix after you apply processing. A great tip is to sum your mix into mono and then make EQ adjustments. This takes stereo width out of the equation, which can sometimes make balancing your mix a little challenging. If you sum your mix to mono and the low end sounds a little too overpowering, apply a low shell filter, reduce some of that low end energy, and then flip your mix back into stereo. If the mix still sounds good, you've just achieved mono compatibility. Your mix isn't gonna sound the same in mono and stereo, but it should sound balanced regardless of how you listen to it. If you can get away with making a significant improvement to the mono version of your mix without sacrificing how it sounds in stereo, that's a big win. EQing your mix in mono is one really good way to do this. The reason super advanced EQs exist is because when you work as a mastering engineer, you have to deal with mixes that are a total mess sometimes and certain advanced features help with that. But again, if you mixed your song to the best of your ability, using the tools at your disposal, and it sounds how you want going into the mastering process, you don't necessarily need crazy mastering plugins. FabFilters Pro Q3 is my mastering EQ of choice because it provides a bunch of different filter types, dynamic bands, various phase modes, mid side processing, a customizable spectrum analyzer, and tons of other features that make mastering other people's music easier. I don't always have access to a client's full mixing session, so if I can fix a tricky issue using one of the Pro Q3's advanced features, features without asking the client to bounce a new version of their mix, it saves time. We could dive really deep into this plugin, but this is an entry level mastering tutorial, so we're gonna keep things light. Applying a limiter to the end of your mastering chain will allow you to increase perceived loudness levels by reducing the dynamic range of your mix as you drive it into the ceiling of the limiter. If you've mixed your song appropriately, you shouldn't have any issues achieving a nice loud master. Yo, she just wanna be my Loudness is actually measurable and I have a whole video dedicated to how loud you should master your music for streaming services and why, but to sum it up, you wanna aim for an integrated loudness level of negative 13 LUFS or higher. If you decide to go higher than negative 13 LUFS, it's a matter of preference and not a requirement. Your mix will sound more dense and compressed, which is something you may or may not like, but you can also use your reference track to gauge how loud to master your song. For example, if your reference track is a super loud EDM song clocking in at negative six LUFS, you could just aim for negative six LUFS. Controlling the LUFS level of your song can be done using a limiter. Driving the limiter harder will increase the LUFS level while laying off the limiter will reduce the LUFS level. When measuring integrated LUFS, you need to analyze your entire song from start to finish to capture an accurate integrated LUFS value. Streaming services normalize songs based on the overall LUFS level of the song and not just the LUFS level during the chorus or drop, so keep that in mind when taking an integrated LUFS measurement. Certain mastering DAWs like WaveLab actually let you analyze the LUFS level of songs without playing them back in real time, which is nice, but if your intro is playing back at negative 12 integrated 
made LUFS, and the chorus is even louder, it's pretty safe to bet that the whole song is meeting that minimum negative 13 LUFS requirement, so you don't have anything to worry about. One to two decibels of gain reduction is considered light limiting, while six to eight decibels of gain reduction is regarded as substantial. When limiting your track, try to avoid sucking all the life out of it. If your drums don't feel impactful anymore, you've limited your track too much. Another thing to listen for when limiting is distortion. If the look ahead time on your limiter is set too low, you risk introducing unwanted distortion into your song. Turn up the look ahead time on your limiter or dial back the gain reduction being applied to avoid distortion. Fabfilters Pro L2 is the limiter that a lot of people use. It has tons of customization options and multiple different limiting algorithms that you can choose from. You can push this limiter really hard without it distorting. And if you want a professional quality mastering limiter, this is what I recommend you get. I have a full video that walks through all of the Pro L2's features and explains how to use it. So I definitely recommend you check that out. Regardless of the limiter that you use, you should leave yourself with at least two decibels of headroom. This is going to avoid distortion from being introduced to your master when it gets transcoded after being uploaded to streaming services. Doing this is going to slightly reduce the loudness of your master, but since streaming services like Spotify are going to normalize the loudness of your music anyways, it doesn't matter and you're going to avoid distortion. The last point I want to make regarding loudness is that you need to set tight track levels while mixing to achieve a loud master. If you don't do that, your limiter is going to distort prematurely when you drive your mix into it. I've included a link to an article that I wrote called How to Make Your Music Loud. It goes over seven different things you can do while mixing and mastering to maximize loudness without ruining your mixes. The mastering meter provides you with information about your mix, but it doesn't apply processing to your mix. There are spectrum analyzers, spectrograms, vector scopes, phase correlation meters, level meters, and loudness meters. Each type of meter provides you with a different type of information. I tend to rely on my ears more than meters, which is why my workflow doesn't revolve too heavily around mastering meters, but they can still be helpful. For example, if there's a resonant sound in your mix, you could use a spectrum analyzer to pinpoint the frequency that resonates resonances at and deal with it however you want. As you saw before, we were using a loudness meter built into the Pro L2 to measure the loudness of a mix. If you're looking for a good all-round mastering meter suite, Isotope's Insight 2 is my recommendation. It provides a whole bunch of different mastering meters that you can use to analyze your mixes. This is definitely something that's useful because it can help you pinpoint certain types of issues that you might have trouble identifying the source of by ear. You don't need something this substantial immediately, but it is something to look into down the Line. Before you export your master, make sure to select the range of time you'd like to export and leave a little bit of space at the end to allow reverb and delay to die out. You can even automate the gain on your master track to add a fade and ensure there are no sounds that get cut off. Another little gain automation trick you might want to use involves automating the level of different sections. By turning down the verses in your songs by around 2 decibels, the choruses will sound louder in comparison, making them feel more impactful when they hit. You can either do this before or after your limiter. The results will be slightly different. Reducing gain before your limiter means the limiter won't drive as hard, so the dynamic range will be larger during the verses, while applying gain reduction after your limiter will ensure your mix gets as compressed as before, but the output level is just turned down. Try out both methods and see what you like more.
So at this point, you need to run a final test to make sure that all of the processing you've applied is actually helping your mix and not hurting it. Adding utility to the end of your processing chain to reduce the level to make an accurate AB comparison is what you need to do. You're gonna match the loudness of the unprocessed mix by ear. And if you hear things you don't like, now is the time to tweak or remove processing. If you find that you don't really like all of the processing you've applied or you've discovered that it's not helping your mix in some way, you can just use a limiter, it's okay. That's a really safe bet. You're not gonna destroy your mix using a limiter if you've dialed in the settings properly. And there's not a whole lot that can go wrong. You might not benefit from using some of the other forms of processing in the right way, but it's gonna be a very small difference. And in the audio example I'm about to play, you'll hear that the extra processing I have applied sounds a little bit better, but it's not necessarily gonna make or break the song. Yo, she just wanna be my mind squeeze, yeah, yeah. Stuck in the trap, I can't leave, look, look. I've been cooking for like four weeks, yeah, yeah. Team Glossy, we need go to check. Boy, I'm about to flex. Point me to the beach. Sachi when I dress. Gucci on the sheets. Yeah, you know I'm mixing match. Different women, different scenes. Stumbles on the track. Verbs on the beat. When you export your master, you want to export it at the sample rate you recorded at. This song was recorded at a sample rate of 44.1, so that's the sample rate I'm going to export the master at. People will debate about which sample rate to record at until the end of time, but 44.1 is perfectly fine for producing music, and that's the sample rate that I record, mix, and master my music at. Some streaming services might convert the sample rate, while others may not. For example, if you recorded at a sample rate of 96 kilohertz and export your master at the same sample rate, Spotify will downsample this to 44 1 kilohertz, while iTunes will leave the sample rate as is. DistroKid lets you upload songs at a sample rate up to 96 kilohertz, so that means the maximum sample rate it makes sense to use if distributing your music through DistroKid is 96 kilohertz. You want to use a bit depth of 24. That's the highest fixed point bit depth that you can export your music to streaming services at, and before you export your song, you should apply dither, which is low level noise that prevents quantization distortion. These are concepts that are pretty technical, but I've included a link to an article I wrote about sample rate and bit depth, as well as an article about dither that you can check out if you're interested. With these settings dialed in, you can export your song. Take a listen to it in stereo and mono, and if everything sounds good, you can upload it to streaming services using a music distributor like DistroKid. Again, if you need a music distributor, you can save 7% on your first year's DistroKid membership using the link below. So now you know how to fix some really common issues while mastering, and assuming your mixes are good, you should be able to create masters that are good too, and that are more than acceptable to upload to streaming services. Obviously, I haven't taught you everything there is to know about mastering, but over time, you'll pick up new mastering techniques and sort of add these to your tool belt of mastering skills. The more of these skills you have, the more problems you'll be able to solve, and the more effective you'll be at mastering different types of songs. The next step would be to sound treat your home studio properly if you haven't already done so. Acoustic treatment is one of the most essential parts of your music studio. It allows you to trust your ears. The untreated room will color the sound produced by your speakers in various ways, which means the mixing and mastering decisions you make may be misinformed. The result is that the mixes you perceive as balanced on your speakers won't translate well to other playback systems. Before you go out and start buying a bunch of fancy mastering plugins, save up your money and spend it on sound treating your studio. I know it's not fun or flashy, but acoustic treatment is gonna have a massive impact on the masters you're capable of creating more than any plugin out there. I've included a link to a guide on sound treating your home studio, and it's surprisingly easier and more affordable than you'd think. After that, you wanna assess the quality of your studio monitors. A good studio monitor will provide minimal distortion, exceptional stereo imaging, a wide frequency response, 
neutral sound coloration, and a high volume level even with a small cabinet. Kali Audio recently sent me these ION5 monitors that are three-way 5-inch monitors that are great for mixing and mastering. They make it really easy to hear small details in your mix that other monitors hide, and there's some super cool technology that makes them a great affordable option for home studio owners. If you want to learn more about the ION5s and why I recommend them, I've included a link to a studio monitor buyer's guide that features the ION5s. Hit that thumbs up if this video helped you out, and if you want to learn how to produce better music fast, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss out on tips, tutorials, and gear roundups. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Dr.